Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am not going to show you what's under here because if you were paying attention before worship and before I got vested, you would know what I'm wearing underneath here. And it's not a 49er shirt. <laughs> How many of you saw Pastor Tim Christensen on the web or on some, okay. He is an ELCA pastor of our synod and a friend of mine, a colleague, and he has a wild, wild sense of humor. And I assure you, he did do worship afterwards. But he was just having a little fun just like I did last week and will again today, <laughs> but not here. So uh, anyway, it's good to be reminded that Christians uh, don't have to be serious and we sometimes do take ourselves too seriously and I'm, uh, I'm the foremost at that one. So, but, uh, but to remember that, that uh, the pressure is not on us. The pressure is not on us. John was doing his job, baptizing for the forgiveness of sin. That's what God sent him to do. And then he sees something. He sees something that has to do with Jesus. And he proclaims, he identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God, not once but twice in our text. The Lamb of God who carries away, who takes away, who, who carries off the sins of the world, of the cosmos. And you know, this is a bit strange to say in the gospel, well, in this early part of Jesus' ministry. See, lambs and goats were associated more with sacrifice like sacrificial offerings and what have you. The Passover lamb would be the first thing that would come to a Jewish person's mind. Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Passover lamb. Hmm. But th that lamb has no association with sin or forgiveness. That lamb was, was, was killed. Its blood used to be a sign of protection of being chosen and was eaten hurriedly in preparation for escape from, Israel, uh, from Egypt. Now if we go back further to Genesis chapter two, 22, we have, we have this remembrance of Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain for sacrifice, for worship. And God prevents Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, knowing that Abraham would do anything God asked, and instead provides a ram to sacrifice instead of Isaac. But going back further still, it was Abel who kept sheep and offered his firstlings to God as his worship. And this pleased God, which angered his brother Cain. So Lamb of God was not really a common image for Messiah. But there is one place, at least one place, that describes something closer to what John is proclaiming about Jesus. It's from Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7, where the prophet speaks of the servant of God as a lamb. Who was this servant? We're not quite sure. But when we read through the lens of, uh, of the gospel of Christ Jesus, we see Jesus in this. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment 
that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The sufferings inflicted were the result of the sins of others, and the servant of God experiences violence that would atone for sin. But is this what John the Baptist is really saying about Jesus? We think so. In fact, we, we've already read through the Gospel of John, and we know that Jesus is the one who, who pays the price, who dies for our sins because of our sin. But there's more. Do you remember some years ago, Billy Mays and OxyClean? How he'd hawk, he'd hawk it on TV and, and, and talk about the great cleaning powers of OxyClean. I have some in my laundry. And there would always be that. And, and now every, just about every infomercial has it. But wait, if you order now, there's more. We'll double the offer. Huh. Yeah, trying to sell you on needing this product. So what kind of introduction was John the Baptist really making? Is the writer of the gospel giving away the ending? Because we do believe that Jesus came to make cosmic changes in our lives, in this world that he died to take away our sin, to cleanse us, to make us right with God. John's intro to introduction to Jesus, to those at the river Jordan, he's pointing to Jesus. He's not trying to sell them on him. He is simply pointing to Jesus and telling them, but there's more, there's more. God revealed to John that this Jesus is the Son of God, the Chosen One, the Messiah. But he doesn't use those words in our text. Now things are coming a little bit better into focus. There's more. And two disciples hear these words and decide to check out this Jesus when John says it again. Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, I know the word evangelism strikes fear and trembling in most of our lives. It does in mine, too. <laughs> it has to do with proclaiming the good news. Unfortunately, there have been some Christian tactics that have been quite a turnoff. But wait, there's more. There's more to evangelism than that, than what we have seen. John simply pointing to Jesus and telling what he knows and believes. He's not trying to sell anyone a product to help their faith. He's pointing to Jesus and identifies him as the one waited for the Chosen One, the Messiah, the Anointed. I want you to think for a moment, who introduced you to Jesus? Was it a parent or a grandparent? A Sunday school teacher? A neighbor? Now, did the person who introduced you to Jesus try to bribe you into believing? Now, if you believe, there will be double the blessings. 
or did you meet Jesus through them and want to know a little more? Did you fall in love with Jesus? St. Augustine wrote in his book, Confessions, which is autobiographical, and if you haven't read it, it is a wonderful read. He says in the second paragraph of his book, You have made us, O Lord, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until it rests in you. There's something stirring in all of us. And those two disciples that go off after Jesus, they had been looking for something. They had attached themselves to John, thinking there was hope. They heard his teaching. They were baptized. But there was more. And John let them know there was more. When John the Baptist points to Jesus as the Lamb of God, they leave John and they follow Jesus. Not because they believed, but because they wanted to know more. Jesus' first words here in John are a question. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Are you looking for certainty that, uh, that you've been forgiven? Are you looking for certainty that you're okay, that you belong? Are you looking for something to fill a hole in your life? What are you looking for? Jesus wants to know. What are you looking for? And those disciples said, well, teacher gives you a clue what they're looking for. They're looking for someone who wants, who would be their teacher, who would help them grow in their faith, grow in, in, uh, in whatever ways that they are searching for. What can you teach us, Jesus? If we follow after you, what will you show us? And Jesus doesn't give them some big theological diatribe or discourse about, about, uh, about life and, and what they should be doing. He says, come and see. Come and find out for yourself. And it's after spending time with Jesus that Andrew comes to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is more than a teacher. And not only that, he goes and tells his brother Simon, we have found the Messiah. We have met the Messiah. Come and see. I love this text because it reminds us that no matter what our perspective is on Jesus, he invites us in to come in and find out who he is what he's up to. He meets us right where we are with our doubts, our, our, our concerns, our, our uncertainty, our hopes and dreams, our joys. He meets us right there. John didn't do anything to help Andrew believe. Jesus did. Meeting Jesus changed Andrew. This model of evangelism is faith that works to reveal Jesus to those around us. No eloquent, eloquent words to debate or convince someone. No hustle, no bribe, no double the offer, double the blessings. Introducing Jesus to a restless heart, to someone looking for something more than our culture or our world can offer, simply is revealing Jesus and who Jesus is for you. 
God is the one who revealed Jesus as the Messiah to John and to Andrew. John revealed Jesus to those around him. And disciples are called to do the same, to introduce Jesus and allow Jesus the opportunity to meet a person where they are. It takes the responsibility off of us. I get a little uptight when someone asks me, well, so how many people have you saved? None. Jesus saves, right? I don't save anybody. And neither do you. And so the burden is lifted from us. All our fears about sharing, about pointing to Jesus, about revealing him to our neighbors, we can let that go and just trust that when we share and reveal Christ in our lives to others, that if there is a restlessness in their heart, and there is, we know that, they might not know that, but that gives Jesus an opportunity to minister, to, to meet that person, to meet us right where we are. We can tell what we believe. He's a teacher. He's a good man. He is God in the flesh. He is my Lord and Savior. We can let others know that there is more, much more. Amen. The hymn of, our, of the day is O Zion Haste, number 668. Please stand as you are able. <clears throat> 